Thank you so much. I'm actually not sure how I'm going to beat a, a talk on uh, virtual reality, um, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, but more seriously, I'm actually quite overwhelmed by the quality of speakers in this uh, track. So uh, again, I will do my best. Um, you may be surprised to see me rather than Chris, who was supposed to give this talk uh, originally. Fortunately, at almost the last minute, he was um, uh, asked to basically do some other things that he had to do. Uh, so that's why I'm here. Uh, nevertheless, um, Chris Sorov is the architect of this talk um, and of the concept behind it. Uh, we've discussed it hopefully enough that I will be able to convey um, uh, the spirit of his uh, presentation and not embarrass him or the rest of my team. So a um, bit of introduction for myself. Um, I work for Oracle Labs, a principal member of technical staff there. Uh, Chris and I work on similar um, things and and that they were both, both building language implementations. Chris is a manager of a team that's building a, a Ruby language implementation. I'm part of the team that's building an R language implementation. I'll talk about all language implementations that we have, so sort of everything should even itself out eventually. Um, what I'm going to talk about today in a bit more detail is um, I will try to introduce the framework on which those languages are being built. Uh, I will um, tell you a little bit about the how how it works, and also a little bit about how it, it can be used, or how you can use it to build your own languages. Uh, I will also talk about the languages that are being, that are having, or are being built on top of that, that platform, and show you some performance results. So that you hopefully will be convinced at the end of the talk that, well, it's relatively easy to build languages on top of it, but also that it kind of makes sense because they actually perform pretty well. Uh, but obviously, I'll leave the final decision up to you. All right, so let's start with uh, something that we always have to do, and I just skipped it. Um, which is what you don't have to read, but uh, basically it's required by our lawyers. It basically means don't uh, buy or sell Oracle's talk based on uh, what you're going to hear today, because everything that I'm going to talk today uh, about is be so cheap. Sorry, I have to do it. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes to, but everybody has to, uh, and it's not only Oracle, actually. Um, so what's the big, I the big idea behind uh, Truffle and Growl? Uh, well, the big idea is that um, we are building an infrastructure which will make it easier for people, we hope, to build all sorts of different languages on top of um, um, our infrastructure, uh, which is um, built in Java. And so you build out your language implementations in Java as well. Uh, the big selling point is, of course, that you, know, you can write an interpreter fairly easily and fairly quickly, but it will not perform well. So the big selling point is that with our framework, you will be able or should be able to write the languages fairly fast, but they also should perform fairly well. And uh, the current language implementations that we have are basically across the board competitive with uh, the best uh, implementations out there, actually competitive or better than the best uh, language implementations out there. And the effort into building them uh, that we put into building them is actually significantly lower. What we don't always talk about is that the framework is also fairly good for um, incrementally improving your existing implementation. So once you write an implementation, uh, sort of using the just the most basic primitives, uh, it should be already fairly decent in terms of performance. But in order to sort of take it over the edge and make it really, really fast, you kind of don't have to do the all the work all at the same time. You can actually add ex ad additional uh, um, pieces of to the implementation gradually to make it, again, gradually even uh, more and more fast. So I'll start with um, um, sort of a, an overview of how people traditionally built programming language implementations, uh, both in the past and actually currently. Uh, so one idea is that, of course, you can write everything from scratch. Typically, it's been done uh, in some low-level languages, such as C or C++. Uh, and of course, you can have an extremely fast uh, and well-performing implementation done, th done that way. But it really typically takes either years or even tens of years of development. And one example is Oracle's uh, Java Virtual Machine, Hotspot, which uh, has been developed for, I think, over 20 years. Uh, another example, IBM's J9 uh, virtual mach Java Virtual Machine, I think 18 years. So it's, it's a significant amount of effort. There are tens of people on each team. Uh, you can't really do this kind of project in, you know, say, a year or two. Uh, and there are reasons for that, uh, because writing so low-level languages like C++, C++, C++ are just not the best tool to be used to write these types of implementations. One of the reasons is that 
typically, especially if you write an implementation for a sort of higher level language that has a garbage collector, that you have to manage everything that's related to automatic memory management by yourself. So you have to have the compile that constructs the maps that keep track of all the pointers and what if you, if, if you have moving collector, then of course it's an additional layer of complexity and so forth and so on. So, so it's, it's possible to do, to, to, to do the language implementation that way, but it's also kind of tricky. And uh, don't have to take my word for it. Um, Cliff Click, who is uh, the original, one of the original um, uh, authors of the C2s that uh, optimizing the, the sort of the heavy lifting compiler and the hotspot and then worked at Azul, at Azul later on optimizing the same platform for like mach machines that have hundreds and hundreds of threads. That's basically what he says. Right? He would not do this again. And I trust him. I am not in the business for as long as he is, but I sort of know his work and I think that you know his uh, opinion actually has pretty you know, pretty heavyweight, at least for me. And one of the reasons, or actually most, uh, or part of the reason why, why he says that is exactly what I just mentioned, which is that, you know, if you have to have, if you, if you have a garbage collector, collector in the VM that you're building in a low-level language, it's just basically a nightmare to write, debug, and maintain. All right, so what, what, can, what else can we do? Well, we can use some tool, some tool chains that will help you, right? So one, uh, one idea is that you will write your interpreter uh, in, say, C, which is fairly simple. But then you don't write a compiler uh, optimizing compiler in C. Instead, if you use something that they're already out there, right? And one of one of the things that people tried is to use uh, LLVM, which is uh, kind of both um, a, a, a compiler by itself in the sense that you know it compiles C, C++ Fortran code, but it's also a tool chain. So you can sort of take the code generator um, out of it, um, which takes as an input intermediate some intermediate representation. Uh, and then you can write your interpreter that will just generate that, inter that intermediate representation and give it to the uh, backend to compile. And of course, that's easier than writing everything from scratch. But for the kinds of languages that I'm, we're interested in, I'm talking about, which is the, the high, uh, the high-level languages, the dynamically typed languages, this doesn't quite work as well as people hoped. And there have been some projects at Google, um, the Unlaid and Swallow. Uh, Rubinius, I actually don't know who's the author of that. Um, of that project, but th that's exactly what they did, right? They wrote a simple imp interpreter, uh, uh, they generated the uh, LLVM IR, and they used LLVM backend to compile it. And they got very minor speedups, actually. Um, and um, why? Why is that? Uh, that? The reason for it is that you actually have to have a very sort of thick layer that does language-specific optimizations between your interpreter and your backend. The LLVM was just a glorified code generator, in, in fact. I mean, the LLVM backend is actually a glorified uh, code generator. Uh, and even there were some other efforts that were more successful in terms of performance, such as FTL, which is um, a sort of a fourth layer JavaScript JIT uh, that has been put into WebKit at some point, uh, actually recently, I think 2014, um, to generate very efficient JavaScript code. And it used LLVM as a backend, and it did all the sort of necessary high-level optimizations before the code has been passed has been passed to the LLVM uh, backend. But even they abandoned LLVM, and I actually don't, don't really know why, and wrote their custom backend uh, to generate native code. So I'm not aware of a currently existing successful um, approach that uses that technique that actually works for the dynamic type languages. Um, so you can sort of play with it, but Again, it's a lot of effort because you have to build that uh, custom optimization layer by yourself from scratch. And of course, the interpreter as well. Another option uh, which people used, and there are like, some not abandoned uh, projects that are using uh, that technology, is, um, is to build everything on top of a JVM. What this helps you with, of course, is that the JVM provides all sorts of interesting and well-implemented well, uh, well and um, uh, perf well-performing services like sort of garbage collectors that have been developed again for 10 or 15 years that are very robust and very fast. Um, so the, the, the idea is of course to again write an interpreter of sorts or, or actually maybe um, more like a source to source translator. Not quite because the translation is actually from the source to the bytecode. Right? So ob obviously Java virtual machine defines a set of, set, set of bytecodes so you can ri write a translator uh, that will translate your source code which is fairly simple to the Java bytecode and then hopefully the Java virtual machine will do the, do the, do the right thing and in, uh, optimize the, um, the execution of your program because it has also a rather advanced JIT compiler built into it. Um, and there are projects, again, that exist that 
use that technology. Um, but they also, for some reason, they don't perform all, all that great. I mean, they uh, some examples are NASHORN is, is actually a JavaScript implementation that runs on top of a JVM. And it's very, I mean, it's, it's convenient to use because you can co interface with Java libraries, but compared, for example, with performance of the V8 engine from Google, it's actually not that great. The performance is just not that great. Ruby, on the other hand, is faster than the uh, original uh, Ruby implementation, but that's because the original Ruby, Ruby implementation doesn't even have a JIT. So yes, it is a little faster, but only like a couple times faster. And technically, you should be able to go like, you know, 10, 15 times faster than an interpreted uh, version. Um, so why is that? Why, why this approach doesn't work either? Uh, I'm going to drill into this a little bit more because our approach is actually similar, but with a twist. So what's going on in, uh, when you sort of use that approach, when you try to use that approach? Well, you have a um, virtual machine, hotspot in our case, could be J9, could be any other JVM, and you sort of pour bytecodes uh, into that black box from the top. Somewhere there you have a JIT compiler, and you hope that somehow, you know, that bytecode flowing through that complicated C++ code base uh, will reach the JIT, the right heuristics will trigger, and the right thing will happen to your, uh, to your program. And it will be compiled, and it will be uh, compiled efficiently, and, uh, and it will then execute efficiently. Uh, well, the problem is that, that this is a complicated piece of code, and you really have no control over what happens to your bytecode, to the code that you, to the, the, the code that you pour into the black box after you do that. So you have no control over what the JIT is doing and a lot of things can trip it. Like you have you know, inlining budgets and things like that that you have literally no control over. So it may perform well, but there is no guarantee and you can do nothing about it if it doesn't. Um, so that's where we come in. So we use a similar approach, um, just sort of starting with the same picture, uh, but we actually take the JIT outside out of the picture, or, or we sort of move it to the side. We re-implemented the JIT, I'm not me obviously, but the team that I'm working with. Uh, we re-implement the JIT, uh, it's in a re-implement in Java, and a sort of it's much cleaner implementation, and it's also, what you will see later, sort of positioned outside of the JVM. So you sort of decouple compilation of the, your program with the runtime services that uh, uh, the JVM can provide you, like garbage collection, which gives you a lot more control over what the JIT is doing. Still sort of manually uh, controlling the JIT is not the easiest thing that um, you would, especially if you don't know the JIT implementation, it's not the easiest thing that you would like to try probably. So what we also provide as part of the infrastructure is a framework that helps you develop your language implementations. And I will talk about more about what this uh, framework provides, but it basically is a framework that helps you um, implement interpreters for the languages that are then supposed to, and are in our case, uh, efficiently execute on the existing infrastructure. So that brings, that brings me sort of to our favorite term, uh, which is that this is sort of the one VM that rules them all. So what it means is that we have a, an infrastructure that consists of several components and can be used for uh, basically all your programming language needs. Um, so uh, if you want to run Java as before, uh, then of course we can do that. There's a hotspot, uh, por portion of the hotspot com uh, virtual machine that provides the runtime services. There's a Graal compiler, and you know, you can run Java and Scala sort of directly, uh, compile uh, the bytecodes using Java C, uh, in case of Java to bytecodes, uh, put the bytecodes through uh, Graal, and use hotspot for runtime services. Um, that actually performs equally well to uh, the existing uh, configuration with the C2 compiler, with the optimizing compiler of Hotspot. Uh, but what's more interesting, at least from my perspective, because I actually work in this space here, is that you can implement all sorts of different languages, uh, and those three are actually implemented uh, in the labs. There are other and uh, that are being implemented in the academia uh, that work by interfacing with this framework that then talks to the Graal compiler that then can talk to the serv uh, services that um, are provided by the virtual machine. You may be sort of curious what that component is. Uh, so that is uh, our uh, internal effort to remove the craft that is uh, still present in the hotspot that's related to the features of Java that we really don't need 
when we're just executing a standalone implementation of R or Ruby or JavaScript. So for example, the way that normally it works is that you have all, all, the, all this implementation are written in Java, right? But you have all the code in Java that you need to run Ruby programs in this box. This is Java, this is Java. So you have basically the whole world, and yet Hotspot has to do things like uh, take care of like dynamic class loading or reflection. And we don't need that, right? So uh, what this effort here is trying to do is to, to try to provide the minimum s minimal subset of Java that is needed to sort of package all of this, uh, all, all of this sort of language execution environment into one binary that you can either execute, and it will be executing actually faster, the startup in particular will be faster, or you can make a DLL out of it and embed it into your application and just use it, you know, from, I don't know, inside of a database. One could uh, have such an idea, for example. Um, and we have some efforts also ongoing on having the Java and LLVM bitcode, which would give us C, C++, and Fortran execution at the same level as the truffle languages. What that means is that if, for example, R wants to talk to a native interface with Fortran, it doesn't have to go to J and I as it would normally have to, but it can sort of talk directly with, uh, uh, with, the, with Fortran implementation because all of this will be eventually compiled to the same inter intermediate representation that Graal compiler understands. So there will be no native boundary crossing in any direction, which is very cool. But these, these two projects are still sort of in a rather experimental stage. You might have heard a talk about uh, Sulong, which is this project um, uh, earlier this week. If not, I think Manuel may be here in the audience, or not, or if not, Manuel Rigger is um, the person to talk to, and he's at the conference. There are other possibilities, of course. I, there was not meant to be an exhaustive list. list. Um, uh, R Python, in particular, is uh, a, an infrastructure that's conceptually similar to what we have. Uh, of course, it's implemented in a different language, and one of the main differences that uh, it lies in the compiler. So they use, it's, it's just a, a basically a, a, a meta tracer. So yeah, they use tracing uh, uh, com technology to compile their code, whereas a Graal compiler is sort of a traditional uh, compiler that compiles functions and methods. Um, and of course there are differences inter in the interface in performance, because as it happens, our performance of the two languages that are mentioned in the slide s happens to be faster. Um, there are other approaches um, to meta programming. Uh, you can implement DSLs uh, in Racket. Uh, of course, you can use uh, the CLR similarly to that you use uh, the Java Virtual Machine bytecode uh, in the sense that you can compile your languages to, to CLR. But actually, we so I'm just mentioning them so that you know you have a better picture of what's available. I'm not going to focus on those technologies today. So. Now it's time to sort of tell you a little bit more about, you know, what Truffle and Graal actually do. Uh, so, um, how does this technology work? As I mentioned, you as a program implementer, uh, programming language implementer, is you're responsible for creating a language interpreters. So, just for the sake of it, I'll explain briefly what a language interpreter, uh, what the what the interpreter or AST interpreter is. AST interpreter is basically um, or AST is a, uh, as a representation of a program uh, that consists of uh, nodes uh, that uh, represent uh, the semantics of uh, operations in the language. And the AST interpreter executes the program by walking uh, the AST tree and executing the operators, right? So it's fairly simple. Also, if left by, it by itself, by, on its, you know, by itself and without any support for, for JIT compilation or things like that, it is typically rather slow, and I just lost the mic. All right, let's see if I can fix it by myself. Can I still be heard? Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so so what does uh, what does our infrastructure do? Um, what our infrastructure does, oh, I think is it, it's not quite working anymore. No, oh, that's not going, that's not going good. I think we'll be um, bouncing off the shirt. Slap right there. Hmm? We'll try. All right. So um, one of the things that um, um, is the source of the overhead in AST interpreters is that every um, for every node which represents some operation will have to handle all types of uh, inputs that can 
uh, flow into that node. So imagine that a node implements um, a function call, um, and then you know the tree that's sort of underneath is the function itself, right? Um, or actually, no. Maybe a, an easier example would be uh, that a node represents an, um, an addition operator. Okay. So imagine that you have a language where you have different data types, like you know, let's say int, double, string, right? So um, normally, in an ASD interpreter, you would have to have uh, a node that will do something meaningful for every combination of those types, okay? Which is, of course, not that great because you have to have uh, like some if statement with which is branches, uh, and you have to sort of do like you know if instance of if argument one instance of something then do something, and if uh, if it's instance of something else then do something else. This is not very fast. So what our infrastructure does. So while the program executes, it actually rewrites the tree. So it rewrites the tree to um, use the simpler implementations of um, a given of given nodes. So for example, if you you start with an uninitialized initial, un node, which uh, that's basically what comes out of the parser, uh, and say the first argument to the addition this would be two arguments, but for the sake of the presentation, let's assume that it's two arguments, uh, would be int. Right, so this is this is the sort of the transition graph of how the how the how the rewriting would work. So from an initialized node, the uninitialized node would be replaced by a node that knows how to handle int integers. And in the best in the best case, for this particular instance of that operator in your code, that would be the only type that is used ever, because that would be the most efficient way of implementing that operation. But life is not ideal, so you know at the subsequent invocation of that particular um, source line of source code, you may have a double flowing into that node. So in this case, we'll transition and have uh, sort of a chain in the AST of two nodes that will, one of them will be prepared to handle integers, the other one will be pre prepared to handle doubles. And, you know, the whole thing sort of repeats itself until there may be more types, until you basically end up in a situation, if you try all the types that are possible in your type system, you, you end up in a situation when you handle when you are in the node that handles them all, which of course is not fast, and the hope is that will not happen often. That most of the time, either a function call would have uh, parameters with the same types, or operators would have uh, uh, operands with the same types. And of course, you can go also you know the other direction and say go from initialized to string and then straight to generic. So the ultimate result of this process of running your program through the interpreter for a little while is that you will have a better, so to speak, AST uh, that contains more efficient uh, operations for your language um, through the rewriting, right? So in this case, this uninitialized tree has turned into a tree where you have some generic nodes and you have some integer nodes. So then the next step that sort of to make it all run a little, you know, a little faster, or in this case, hopefully really fast, uh, is to partially evaluate the tree. So what that means is that at some point, there are some counters that, that, that detect this. You, your runtime may realize that the tree is not changing anymore. So you've been running this for a while, and no more rewrites happen. So that we call the, that, that state of the tree stable, not surprisingly. So if you have a stable tree, then you can try and sort of freeze it, do some optimizations like inlining, because you know exactly what call targets you have, because you know the tree has stabilized. Uh, you know that some of the things, uh, that th some things are not changing, so they'll be constant, so you can do some constant propagation and sort of collapse it all into, but essentially, but essentially compile it. It's not quite compilation to the native uh, representation yet, it's just a compilation with those optimization and lining, basically inlining and constant folding into an intermediate representation that then will be passed on to the actual compiler to generate the, bin the binary code, which it's by itself, it also will do some optimizations. But those are the language sort of level optimizations. They happen because you run your program and you gather sort of information while your program is executing. One could, oh, actually, this is a, an intermediate slide, so to speak. This is, I'm trying sort of to be brief. Uh, I hope I'm making some sense. But it, first of all, if I'm not, please ask me questions. But if I'm making some sense, but not enough, there is, this is a very good talk that actually explains some of these things in a, in a much more detail. It's not actually from my team. It just describes partial evaluation um, um, sort of in a very sort of nice and uh, approachable way. So if you're interested, um, this, is, this is a really good source of information. 
Um, but coming back to, um, to uh, my explanation, um, one could ask what happens if you, know, you gather all the information during runtime, you assumed that your operands are integers, but after compilation, you suddenly start getting doubles. Right? That would be uh, not ideal, but we handle that. Uh, what we do basically is be optimized, right? So there are guards uh, that are placed uh, in the code when you compile it, that will detect it, and if the assumptions that we made are violated, will de-optimize, so the execution will come back to the interpreter, will no longer execute na native code, um, and will re-optimize. So we gather this additional information, so in this case we realize that those two nodes suddenly started getting double op uh, double offerings and we can repeat the whole process optimize re-optimize again and have more efficient code of course it's not going to be as efficient as the code that we had previously but the co code that we had previously did not handle all the operand types that th this one is handling so there's really not much we can do about it so this was kind of abstract a little bit so I wanted to if I have time I think I have time um, I want to show you how this sort of works more operationally, more in practice, on actual code. So this is a very sort of simple JavaScript function that uh, accumulates, uh, sums up um, uh, certain numbers from i to n uh, in the loop and returns that sum. Okay, it's a very simple function. Um, when we um, uh, when we compile uh, or when we you know when we parse this function. We don't know much about what types uh, uh, the operands or the variables in this function have. We however know that type of types of constants, right? They'll be integers. So when you s when you run this uh, function on a, a little bit, you will be able to gather to gather more information about the types in this fun uh, that of the variables that are used in this function. And basically, everything turns to ints because for now, uh, everything that you know, or summation. Um, the increment everything operates on integers. In JavaScript, however, the semantics is such that when you add two integers, the result can be uh, a double. So it basically can overflow to, uh, to, a, uh, to a double value. And if we use small values for increment, this will not happen. That's why we have all ints on this side. This is uh, an ASD representation of that code, of course. So what we can do, can partially evaluate it and compile it down to the native code. Uh, and this is basically the code that comes out of that loop, which is, you know, high level, dynamically typed language, about 12 lines of assembly. This is sort of the kind of code quality that you can expect to get out of, out of the system. And of course you have guards that are not in the compiled code, because that would be slow. They're still in the interpreted code that will be checked before that native code is executed. If they, they fail, that code will be scrapped and we'll, the execution will return to the interpreter, which is exactly what's going to happen if we suddenly give the sum a huge um, value of n. That in this case, this uh, function will no, no longer be, it, 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 it's just not feasible for it, for it to, to uh, operate on integers. We'll start ha have to operate on floats, on, on double precision values. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to throw execution back to the interpreter, re-specialize the tree with uh, uh, operands that operate on double values, and recompile to use uh, floating point instructions. Still pretty good, not as good as before, but again, there's nothing you can do. If your program uses both uh, sort of smaller and larger values of ints, that's what you'll have to do. Um, so. So that's basically what Truffle gives you at the level sort of, of a function. But it also gives you some nice things that happen uh, sort of at the whole graph. When this, uh, in this graph, the sort of subgraphs or subtrees represent functions of your guest language. So this will be an R function, for example, or a Ruby function, or a Ruby method, rather. Um, so similar things happen in the sense that, you know, you can detect you c while, you, while you execute, you can detect which, ca which calls are uh, executed often and you can inline. So that is also done automatically. Again, this is done uh, during partial evaluation. But you, you as a language implementer don't have to worry about this. And the actual inlining is super simple. Everything is represented as a tree. 
So you basically take the root of the tree, the method, uh, the functions uh, tree, and you connect it to the call sign. That's the inlining. That's it. Very cheap. Uh, I'm not lucky today. Let's try again the same trick. It's a slippery uh, name tag, I think. Um, so similar thing that happened before at the level of instructions can also happen at the level of uh, function calls or method calls, which is that you can have a function that's called with different types of arguments, right? So that is bad because that function will have to, the code for this function would have to be generated such that it handles all the types of uh, arguments. So again, it will have to do some dispatch on arguments depend depending on or, or based on the type. Truffle is smart though and can do something about it, which we call cloning of the calls of the calls side. So we had one uh, instance of the tree that represented a function, and this is you know that that what would normally be there. But in this case, in this kind of polymorphic uh, um, um, function, you Truffle could, of course, there are heuristics that um, decide whether it makes sense or not, clone that call. Uh, uh, that function sort of body uh, and have specialized functions, uh, specialized function versions compiled separately. And of course, that could be followed by inline. So you again, you were, you're getting maybe not as efficient code as if you had only a monomorphic function where you have only one type that always flows into it, but it's better than having a, a polymorphic function at all times. So how now you kind of hopefully have a, at least a vague idea of how this works under the hood, but you know what do you have to do to actually use it, right? How does it actually work from the point of view of a language implementer? Um, so I'm going to there are three or four hour tutorials that people from my team give on trying to explain how this works. I'll have to do it in about 11 minutes, uh, so bear with me. And uh, again, I'm welcome all the questions while I talk as well as after the talk. Um, I try to s skip, uh, sort of go through it quickly because I am running out of time a little bit. Uh, so we'll use as an example a simple language. It's simple, but it's actually not super simple. It's not just you know addition uh, operator and uh, that's it. We have uh, it's dynamically typed. Um, uh, the operands are either uh, arbitrary precision integers or strings. It has first class functions. And it has, which is actually important, uh, dynamic function redefinition, and objects, which are very simple key-value stores. So here ha so are some examples. Um, we'll try to really go quickly through this, but I mean, it hopefully, it all looks familiar, right? So this creation of an object, you can define a dynam dynamically a property, assign a value to it, and ac access the property using the, the the square bracket notation. You can have a function uh, here uh, that is called foo but you can redefine that function uh, using a, a built-in uh, of the language. Th these are sort of the two most important things. Of course, there's addition, um, there's loops, and so forth, right? So simple, but not trivial, I would say. Um, all right, um, these are the results, I guess. You could infer it, but who cares? Okay, so how would you normally write an AST interpreter? for this for this kind of language. Uh, this is just an example of, and this is actually not taken out of our framework, but this is how you could write an addition operation for this kind of language, right? So you would have um, child nodes, which represent arguments. So they have to be executed before, um, they have to be executed before the actual operation happens. And then you would check the type of those arguments and you would do something, right? So if they're both long, then you would add, um, you would um, you would add them. Just simply add them. Uh, if they're big integer, which means that they've been sort of you know larger that, uh, than the scope of long, then you would use a different addition operation. And there are strings. You would ca concatenate the strings. This is obviously just a sketch, because what if you had, you know, one of them is instance of long and the other one is inst instance of big integer? Ha! So the list could actually be much longer and much m sort of more tedious to um, to maintain. But th this is basically how we would write it. And at least for me, this is not ideal. So Truffle actually gives you some extra facilities to help you with writing these this kind of code that basically removes uh, the need to write a lot of boilerplate. 
So this is uh, actually a more complete uh, implementation of the same operation. That, that's how we would write it in Truffle, right? So the basic idea is that you have these methods in Java. Of, as I mentioned, everything is written in Java. So if you like Java, that's good. I guess if you don't, then it's not. But I kind of like it. So uh <laughs> so for me, it's, it's convenient. So you have Java methods that uh, implement the logic of your operations, right? So you have you know, a method that takes long and long. So you basically specify an operation that works on longs. You have big integer. You specify an operation that works on big integers, and so forth. This is the key ingredient here. This is part of our DSL. We call it Truffle DSL. Uh, these annotations are being taken, or, uh, or the code and the annotation are input to the uh, uh, annotation processor that does its magic, the analysis of the file, and spits out basically the code that you saw on the uh, previous slide. But uh, sort of there are some optimization that you can do as well. And there are some sort of other, uh, uh, there are some other aspects of the DSL here that are worth mentioning. Um, so for example, in this language, as in JavaScript, operation on long can overflow. So if you add two longs or uh, you add two longs that are uh, too big, they will overflow to big integer. But how would you model this in your interpreter, right? Uh, well, you don't have to worry about it because you have Truffle DSL uh, and this specialization annotation takes an argument uh, or another sort of tag that basically says um, there is but potential for this uh, operation to throw an exception and what you're going to do in that exception is you will rewrite the tree. So say you have uh, an interpreter and you have longs coming into the addition operator and at some point they're too big. So you have essentially addition, uh, addition operator that's um, only no understands longs that's hooked up to the rest of the tree. And at some point, there are these two longs are too big. So what will happen is that the exception will be thrown, and on that exception, that node will be um, replaced with a next a specialization or a method that's in this file that matches the type of argument. So in, in this case, it would of course be uh, the next method. So they are analyzed in order to, by the annotation pro or during the execution, they're analyzed in order to tell which of them is the best match for a given type of operand. And again, you don't have to worry about it, how it's done, because it's all uh, in the generated code. You only have to worry about writing specializations uh, in the sort of order in which you want them to be taken. Because of course, you could completely omit long. <laughs> you could omit the specialization that operates on longs if you had an implicit cast that would cast longs to uh, big decimal, which we actually do have, and it will still work. It would just not be as efficient because you would always have to, this is an object, right? And this is a primitive. This would always have to operate on objects. Um, the last sort of bit of, of the DSL that, that's important here is the guard. So the language semantics, this particular language semantics says that if any of the two arguments is a string, then the result is a concatenation of one of those strings with a string representation of the other argument. So this is exactly what happens here, right? So the check, you write the check as another method. Is if one of them is a string, then this operation will be taken. Okay. The way that this works is that again, if you have if you if you if you have a, an operation that always executes longs, you will get one node. If in addition to that you will see big integers, you will have another node tagged on the end of that node, so that you will have a chain of nodes eventually that will ultimately lead you to the one that during the execution that you or you know the runtime uh, can pick to uh, uh, to do the right thing for the operand types. Another example is how you write um, um, a uh, control flow statement in your language, right? Again, it's simple, it's slightly different. There are no specializations here, but the key is that every function sort of implements one of these one of these methods execute. So these are this is the function that your parent will call on you to get the result of the execution. Of course, if statement doesn't return anything, I mean, in some languages it does, but in simple language it doesn't. So it's only evaluated for its side effects. So this particular execute will not return any value because the parent will not expect to get any value. Uh, and it's simple. You have you know a condition node that gets to uh, that has to be evaluated uh, that is evaluated before uh, this method is, is called. 
you have then an else part and during the execution you basically use the nodes, the child nodes of your of yourself to decide what to do. That's very simple. Um, very simple, but not actually it is quite efficient as it is, but this is one of the examples of what you can do on the next slide to make it even faster. And this is by basically giving compiler, the compiler, underlying compiler, partial evaluator and compiler, a bit more information about what's going on in your code. So in this particular case, we add what is what we call a condition profile. Uh, and what it does is it adds a bit of an extra overhead in the interpreter uh, by sort of adding code that will count how many times which of the branches has been taken. And that helps the compiler that generates the native code to sort of understand how to order branches um, in the end in the, in the native code to sort of the, the take the best advantage of uh, the branch predictor. So this is a sort of a common trade-off if you write a program in, uh, uh, if you try to write a truffle language is that you add a bit of extra overhead to the interpreter but gain a lot of performance in the compiler. And because we're mostly targeting um, our languages target server-side applications. That's the trade-off trade we're willing to take. Um, there are other types of, um, of profiles. So for example, it's a binary profile that you could use in this case, uh, but it only would only make sense if you knew that one of the branches is taken or, or almost that, or that is never taken or that you suspect it will never be taken. Uh, that it would uh, allow the compiler to basically generate a straight line code for this. Since this is an if statement at the language level, that's obviously not the case here. But if you implement other built-in functions, this could be the case. Other types of profiles are type profiles. Sometimes you have just too many different types. Uh, you dispatch on the interface and you just don't know at, uh, at the interpretation time which concrete type you would see as a parameter. So again, a bit of extra code interpreter can help you, can help you remember that and pass it on the decompiler with extra a bit of extra cost. Again, I won't talk more about profiles, but this is the way to sort of incrementally improve um, uh, performance of your language implementation. So you basically see there are some performance problems. We can add these profiles and the problems will be fixed. I am definitely running out of time. Um, all right, so now I have to decide what to do. Um, I think I'm actually going to skip uh, this part in that case. So this is uh, another DSL, um, uh, Truffle DSL feature, which helps you implement uh, uh, caches. In particular, in, uh, polymorphic inline caches for function calls, but we use that machinery, the same machinery to, uh, to implement caching for other uh, um, sort of complex or expensive operations. In particular, for example, in R, we have attributes being stored in arrays uh, instead of hash tables because it's faster, but the lookup, of course, is not faster, so we cache the position of an attribute in an array, and if it stays in the same place, we'll always have a fast result. If not, then we'll have to do a linear scan. So it's just an example, but uh, obviously it's used for function calls, and it makes wonders to uh, the uh, uh, sort of speed of execution. Um, I'm really going to sort of skip that, um, but basically this is the annotation uh, for um, for caches. Um, so you have. Um have a cached annotation on, on an argument that if the uh, guard is uh, true, if the, if the condition in the guard uh, specified in the guard is true, will become a compile time constant, which will let you do constant folding even more and uh, sort of get your program, get your, uh, get your uh, lang language implementation to run even faster. So this is, a, this is a generic example. This is how you would actually optimize a call node. Maybe I'll go really quickly through that. This is a generic implementation of the call node. So you have some arguments that you have to evaluate to execute function. You have some function that you have to look up. Then from Truffle API, you have to create some uh, you know, form of uh, invocation node, uh, call node. And then you call this node with a frame which uh, contains the uh, um, variable mappings. And that's it, right? As you can see, every time you do the call, you have to actually get the call target, which is actually quite expensive. So what you can do, is you can separate concerns and have a special dispatch node that just does the execution, the invocation, and that dispatch node will use the cached annotation uh, to do exactly that. So if the function is the same, and if it hasn't been rewritten this redefined through this redefined function built-in, which is what this assumption annotation does, then you will have 
a direct code target, which already, already uh, the uh, direct phone node, which already knows about its own code target used, and you don't have to use it every time you, c you don't have to look it up every time you call. If, however, this caching fails because you just have either too many functions or too many redefinitions, then you will fall into the generic case, in which case you will still have to look up the code target. Yes? It's a subset of Java code, yes. It, it's not a full Java, and sometimes, so the workaround is it understands uh, method calls, if nothing else. So the workaround is that if the syntax is not quite uh, supported, you can always encapsulate it in a method and define the method in the same file and then call it. So it's, it's a minor inconvenience. We could extend it, but we just, it's, it's basically very subjective what you want to support, right? Um, and I just ran out of time. So, very quickly. Uh, basically, performance, whether that makes sense or not. We should uh, take start taking bets how many more times it will happen by the time I'm over, I'm finished. Hopefully, not more than once. Okay, all right. So, uh, what does it make sense? Is it fast enough? What would, why would we be doing this, right? Uh, if it's easy, that's fine, but if it doesn't perform, so what? So, this is actually just Java running on graph, so there's no truffle involved. Uh, but it compares with essentially the state of the art, which is the server compiler and hotspot. And the bottom line here is, <laughs> I don't want you to look at all the numbers, is that sometimes we're better, sometimes they're better. We're in the ballpark. But that compiler has been writ written in three years by a bunch of grad students, mostly. And the other compiler has been written by professionals, uh, you know, over, again, 18 or 20 years, including Cliff Cliff. Um, so this is, uh, the, tr this is the, the Java performance. And uh, this is a little bit about the truffle language's performance. So again, compare against the state of the art. This is GraalJS, which is our JavaScript implementation. Uh, and again, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but generally very close to the current state of the art. Uh, and again, much less effort has been put into this implementation than into implementation of V8, which as you probably know, has four, three different JITs, for example. And now it also has an interpreter, as you probably found out during one of the talks earlier this week. So very complex architecture. Ours is, I would argue, much simpler. Um, completeness, uh, you know, again, I think it's about three years. Uh, we are uh, actually more complete in terms of uh, um, ECMAScript uh, ES7 support than V8 is. <laughs> and uh, we used to be actually 100% compatible or ECMA uh, 6, but uh, I, I guess some, some things changed and we have to we have some catching up to do, but we're 99.3% complete with uh, ES6. So very high level of completeness on the standard sort of uh, testing suite and really good performance in three years, which, you know, you may think it's long, but if you wanted to implement it from scratch, it's actually not that long. Or JRuby, this is actually even better. Huh? Oops. Uh, this was because my Mac went to sleep. Sorry for the picture. I forgot it's on my uh, on my desktop actually. that or maybe there is no there is almost there all right um so we're at the J Ruby J Ruby is even better because it's uh, 10 to time 10 to 20 times faster uh, than um, uh, than JRuby, which is actually faster than the uh, uh, original Ruby implementation. Um, so this is Chris's work, by the way. So um, And uh, completeness-wise, uh, language spec is very complete. 
uh, and there are some uh, problems or some issues with completeness with respect to ru running Ruby on Rails. Uh, so that's the sort of current status. And they were going for sort of what they thought is the most important thing to support first. So some of them are supported 100%, some of them are supported, you know, a little bit, uh, some of them are not supported yet. But that work is ongoing and will be ongoing for a little while. And then my baby, which is fast R. Uh, we're also pretty fast, uh, even faster than JRuby compared to uh, uh, the uh, reference implementation. Although I have to say we're showing the best numbers here. There's another benchmark suite which is where we're not as fast. But we, we, we are really fast, um, as you will see in status. Uh, uh, well, we can run pr uh, production quality applications uh, internally and they're also pretty fast, at least five times faster than, uh, than a reference implementation. I wanted to talk about Substreet VM a little bit more, but I'm not going to. Um, all of this is open source, all of this is available for download. Uh, of course, not all of it is complete. Um, as source, uh, at this point you have to go through, ha jump through uh, some extra hoops to actually build it. Uh, but with Java 9, uh, all of this Java part you will just download and will just work uh, <coughs> basically as is with the uh, hotspot because there is um, a new compiler interface that's coming out in Java 9, which will support Grub. So that's going to be even easier to use when Java 9 is out. And there is uh, a lot more information that you can find. Um, here, of course, you can talk to me. I'm going to skip through that. And conclusions. Well, we have, we believe, an infrastructure that could be useful, not only to imp for you know, implementing your new languages and for implementing them fast, but also for experimenting with uh, you know language implementations. I know, I know, I'm done. It's high performance and all all that, but I wanted to finish with that slide to be able to thank everybody that actually has been uh, or was and is working on this project. Some of them are in this room. Uh, there's a lot of us. I'm just a tiny cog in this big machine, and I'm grateful that I was given an opportunity to present it here. I hope. I was at least semi-understandable and you got something out of it. And thank you very much all for coming.